Well, June is the time for a lot of hot takes, and we have some hot takes on some hot seats this year in college football. All that and more right here on The Three Technique. One man. Goodbye. Twenty-five, thirty, thirty-five, forty, forty-five, fifty, forty-five. There goes Davis. Oh my God! Davis is going to run it all the way back. Auburn's going to win the football game. I give it to Roger. I give it back now to the thirty. They're down to the twenty. All the band is out on the field. He's going to go into the end zone. Four-man Alabama rush. Got him. No, oh, no, they did no oh, my gracious. Yep. How about that? Welcome in, everybody, to another episode of The Three Technique. I'm Trey Reeves. He's Garrett Turney. And Garrett, we've had an eventful weekend here at Three Tech HQ. Not only did we get our counterpart, Mitch, married, that's why he's not on the show tonight. He's enjoying time with his new wife. Uh, we're, we're enjoying a national championship series, and we're kind of on pins and needles over here as we record this at about, oh, five o'clock central time. And on Monday <laughs> afternoon, if you have been following the College World Series and you know anything about us, that means that we are puddles as we take <laughs> it down. We've got a hard cutoff tonight as we try to watch our Ags go for the first national championship in a major men's sport since 1939. Why wouldn't we be nervous? I I, I don't know. I, Garrett, I, I don't know. Like I, I have psychiatrists and counselors have looked at me and just can't figure it out. Yeah, man, I don't. I don't know what you're talking about with this whole enjoying a run in a national championship series. I'm not enjoying this at all. This has been nothing but nerves and just, you know, terrible, terrible, terrible things in terms of time management and being a responsible member of society and all of that. It's just not something that's happening right now. I don't like these winner take all games. I mean, I guess like, you know, it's better than not getting to play in them. I guess that's true. But man, like I'd, I'd never been through like a, a game seven of the entire season type of thing before for my team. Uh, and so, you know, uh, not really loving that, not really loving the whole uh, the, the vibe right now, at least not from this vantage point. Um, and yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see what happens tonight. Uh, at least right now, the vibes can be high because nothing bad has happened yet. Uh, but you know, we'll see what happens on the next show. I uh, might be coming in with a little bit less energy for the Thursday show. We're either going to be hyped for the Thursday show still and very annoying, uh, or oh, probably yeah. wearing all black. Uh, I don't think there's going to be any it's truly one of the other in between. Um, yeah. And you know, we, we got the game seven for the ALCS last year with the Rangers. That was exciting but that one was over really quickly yeah well then so, like it's an alcs it's not like it's, it's not the world, series. world series right? right like that's my thing and and like obviously like national championship games in college football that's one thing right because it is a winner take all but you only get one game so you can kind of feel excited about it and see it's not like you've seen this team twice and now you're like all right well got to figure it out real quick because it's the last game and I know what they can do and I know what we can do. It's 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 just a totally different beast. And I mean, you know what it is. It, it's fine and we're excited and we're hopefully going to be celebrating, but maybe not. We'll see. We'll take well, Jim Schlossnagel said, you know, what? we're happy to be playing the last game of the season. We're happy to be giving you this podcast and take the edge off of it a little bit. And, you know, we're going to be talking about some fan bases that wish they could experience a uh, winner take all game of magnitude, right? On this episode, as we talk about some coaches that may or may not be on the hot seat entering 2024. Before we get into that, let's tell you about our friends at Home Field Apparel. The good brand is on a roll right now, guys, releasing their, their special mascots, their rare mascot series. They just released the Delta State Fighting Okra, and they've got even more coming down the pipe. I know we got some UTSA Roadrunner fans that listen to this podcast. You guys are finally going to get taken care of in July. Can't wait for that drop personally. Um, but whatever you choose to buy, whether that is for your favorite team or your favorite rare mascot, you can get 15% off your entire purchase at home field using our code 3TechPod or use the link in our Twitter bio for a returning customer discount. And all that money, uh, if you shop with that link or shop with that code, it does go back to support us at the show and help us make the show as great as possible. And Garrett, it's not too late for our friends, the Jimmys and Joes, to get in on the action themselves. Tell us 
who you think will finish one through 18 in each conference as we have these <laughs> massive conferences now. Uh, tell us what you think of the Power Four conferences. On the links on our Twitter bio, it's not too late to enter the competition to get a $150 gift card. You'll select one winner at the end of this week. So it is not too late, but you are running out of time very quickly. You have until, I'll give you Friday at 11.59. And I'm going to run the numbers. I'm going to pull it all on Saturday. If you're not in there by 11.59 Friday, too bad, so sad. But make sure that you are entering that. Four conferences, that means four chances to win that $150 gift card and special surprise second prize that I will tell you what it is on Thursday. Don't worry about it. I promise it will come on Thursday as soon as I figure out what it is. We'll have two winners to tell you about, and we'll DM you on social media as soon as that happens. Garrett, like I said, these fan bases and programs that we're talking about tonight, they would love to be the anxious, nervous wrecks that we are right now as they as we get ready to watch our team play for a national championship on the diamond. They are not close, and they've had <laughs> – of success in the past under their current coaches and tonight we're going to rate them and we're going to tell you how much of a hot seat these guys are on as we head into 2024 we'll go back and forth we have a list of guys to talk about we'll get through i'm not going to promise how many we're going to get to like i did last time that was on me um but we will go as long as we can right up to first pitch as we're recording this on monday night garrett and I thought it would be, you know, we could tell you, oh, it's cold, hot, medium. That's fine. But we are going to go by our friends at Pluckers. Not a sponsor. Certainly could be. If you're a rep at Pluckers, hit me up. I would love a sponsorship deal with you guys, um, as I'm very excited that one is opening up about 10 minutes from my door uh, very soon. But we're going to give you a Pluckers wing sauce. And if you've never been to Pluckers, if you don't live in the Lone Star State, delicious wings varying levels of spice on their sauces as most great wing restaurants have but you know maybe somebody's had a rough year last year but really they're a honey barbecue and they're, they're not really on a hot seat they can just enjoy the ride maybe if they struggle this year we'll talk about moving them up but there's some guys we talk about garrett that i think are all the way up on a fire in the whole buffalo hot situation need to bring the milk out if they don't get it done this season oh yeah no there's I love that we're using the plucker sauces to compare the hot seat right now. I think that's a great idea for this. But yeah, there's a couple guys on this list that we're going to talk about that, you know, you, you talk about the milk, you can think about, you know, the, the hot ones interviews that you see on here on YouTube. And you can think about the guys that bring on just all sorts of different like citruses to try to take the, you know, cut the heat a little bit or, you know, they bring out like, I think Gordon Ramsay brought his own like Pepto-Bismol to like drink. You could think about that, too. There's got to be something happening because, you know, at this point, these coaches are going to be scrambling to say, hey, how can I save my job? And there's a couple of them that we've talked about already a little bit before. We probably won't get into them too much. But these are some of our, you know, hey, we haven't really talked about them a whole bunch in the offseason. But, you know, big programs, proud programs that might be looking for a change. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and hit those honorable mentions off the top here, Garrett. We we will not talk about Ryan Day or Billy Napier. I feel like we've talked about them ad nauseum this offseason already. So go back and find our previous videos. Go back and find our previous podcasts if you want to hear our takes on them. I also don't want to click kick a guy like Clark Lee while he's down because he I know that he said that they could be the best program in the entire country. I, I don't want to kick him while he's down. I know that he's struggling at Vanderbilt and, you know, three wins is a successful season for him at this point. So I, I don't want to get into those discussions either, but I'll let you kick us off here, Garrett. We have a list of guys on our show doc, varying levels of spice on their hot seat. Where do you want to kick us off tonight? Yeah, I want to talk about, and I don't want to start with the one that I think is the most interesting to me. And that's Dave Aranda at Baylor, because the way that Dave Aranda has gotten himself to the hot seat, in my opinion, is just a bizarre path, right? If you look at what Baylor's done last several years, they've been pretty abysmal and not a lot's gone right, except they did win a Sugar Bowl. Like, they, he won a Sugar Bowl with the Baylor Bears, and he did it with 40 yards passing from Bohannon. So, like, you know, we're talking about, you know, players who, you know, they, they flamed out, maybe not as good as they were, you know, maybe a miss, you know, because he ended up going to shaping or whatever else. But I mean, guys, like this is this is not a wonderful, you know, Baylor team right now. 
but they still kind of found their way over the hump with some good defense, you know, back when they were playing in the 2021 season. I know the Sugar Bowls played the next year, but the 2021 season, it's been a couple of really bad seasons since then, though, for Baylor. And that's why Dave Aranda finds himself on the hot seat after being one of the most sought after coordinators for, gosh, what seems like 10 years. It seemed like he was out there. You know, for a whole decade, like, oh, man, whenever Aranda decides to jump, that program's immediate contender. And it looked like it was heading that way. You know, COVID season was standing. And then it just kind of fell apart. And I'm kind of curious what you think is the reason and kind of why you think it's gone off the rails for Dave Aranda and what he might have to do to save his job. Well, you're absolutely right that he was the hotness when he was hired uh, after the 2019 season. And, you know, obviously COVID was an issue his first season. That was an issue for everybody, but there were flashes. They really broke through in 2021. Like you mentioned, they won the Big 12, beating Oklahoma State on that epic final play. If you remember that championship game to get to the Sugar Bowl, I think they beat uh, – they, they made it to a couple of Sugar Bowls recently, just one under Dave Aranda. But this right. one was uh, – I can't remember who they beat in that Sugar Bowl, but it might have been uh, Ole Miss. Ole Miss, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, Ole Miss, you beat Ole Miss in the Sugar Bowl. But to me, this comes down to one major decision for Dave Aranda, and that's choosing Blake Shapin over Gary Bohannon, a guy that led you to a championship. And you mentioned Gary Bohannon not wowing you with the statistics. You mentioned he only put up 40 yards in that Sugar Bowl win over Ole Miss. But – he was a winning quarterback, and that is not something you can just take for granted when you're looking at passing him by for the next new hotness recruit. Blake Shapin might have entered the transfer portal if he didn't get the starting job after that 2021 season. Hey, Garrett, do you know what Gary Bohannon did? Or uh, do you know what Blake Shapin did very recently after this last season? Uh, what did he do? He entered the transfer portal. Yeah, and he yeah. didn't win anything of consequence with him at the helm. Well, and so, listen, was Gary Bohannon going to lead Baylor to a dynasty in the Big 12? And would they have supplanted Texas as the champions of the Big 12 last year and gone to the playoff? Probably not. Would they have beat TCU and gone to the playoff with him at the helm in 2022? Probably not. But would Dave Aranda be on the hot seat if he would have committed him as a quarterback and built around him in a defense and tried to develop weapons either through the portal or high school recruiting? I don't think he'd be on the hot seat. And that's what I'm worried about a little bit to distract a little bit from this topic. Kansas state worries me a little bit about this as they, I know it's a completely different situation um, as they get in with Avery Johnson this year, but they're kind of pulling a Dave Veranda and giving up on a experienced championship winning quarterback for the young new hotness. I think it'll work out better for Kansas state, but that's the decision that just spiraled a bunch of, yep negativity for Baylor under Dave Aranda for my money. Well, and the other note on the sort of quarterback personnel was Kyron Drones was signed at Baylor. You had him on campus. He looked pretty dang good for Virginia Tech last year. Obviously, like there's room for development, room for improvement, but that's going to be any quarterback. You're telling me if you're Baylor, you wouldn't have rather had Kyron Drones on campus last year as an option, maybe prevent you from what was it? Three and nine or whatever they went last year. Like I'm sure you would have rather had Kyron Drones there. Now, one thing that I think is going to help Baylor, and this is why for me right now, I think Dave Aranda is at that Buffalo hot. That's our four out of five right now. It's hot, but I think there's a way to save your job outside of just some kind of miracle season. Like, I don't think they have to be amazing this year, but I think if they take a step in the right direction, specifically with the quarterback play, it will result in a season where he gets more time. Uh, if you look at what they brought in, they brought in Daquan Finn. Daquan Finn is an absolute baller. He's going to be really, really good for Baylor. Um, now, how much help does he get? What's the personnel look like? We'll kind of wait and see in terms of who's going to step up and be his big playmakers and help him make a difference. Also got to you know ask a couple questions about the offensive line. But you know, looking at what Daquan Finn brings, he brings playmaking ability to Baylor. And the other thing that I think really helps is, is that Baylor's in a very different position right now than some of the other coaches on this list, where they're in the Big 12, where, you know, you just got your, you know, big-time legacy programs, Texas and Oklahoma, out the door. You're bringing in a bunch of fresh blood. There's going to be a lot of turnover. There's a power vacuum. And if Baylor can just kind of compete and look okay in year one, I think that's enough to save Dave Aranda's job. 
you know, maybe go six and six, make a bowl game. I think that's, you know, saving his job. I don't think that's anything Baylor fans will be happy about necessarily, but six and six, better quarterback play, you know, kind of keep things going in the transfer portal, you know, maybe go get you another quarterback next cycle through the transfer portal. I think that will go a long way in sort of the personnel and decision-making for Dave Aranda and proving he needs to keep his job. It's a tough schedule. I, I think I do think he has to make a bowl game. I'm going to go four out of five as well. Four flame emojis, Buffalo hot. It's a tough schedule. I think he has to at least make a bowl game. I think he probably has to win seven games for Baylor to feel really confident about keeping him for 2025. And it's a tough schedule to do that. They've got Tarleton State should be a win. they got a couple of tough non-conference games. They're at Utah in a non-conference game early in the year. They've got Air Force. Is that non-conference technically? That Utah game is a non-conference game. Oh, wow. That's scheduled weird. before. Yeah, so absolutely brutal draw that's for bizarre. Baylor to get the best team in their conference, arguably. The conference as a non-conference. As a non-conference game. So even <laughs> if you win, it doesn't help your conference standings. And it's on the road. Oh, man. And they come back home and have Air Force. As a as a non conference game, that's a difficult game to prepare for a week after you go to altitude and get beat up by Utah. So it's a tough road, but I think seven wins is what he needs this year. Or Baylor's going to be looking for a new coach. You're absolutely right, though. DeQuan Finn will be the best quarterback I think he's had at Baylor. But oh, yeah. the question about the Bears has always been since he's arrived, who's he throwing the ball to? And even the yeah. four star guys that they brought in at that receiver position are in the transfer portal or, you know, buried on the depth chart. So development right. is a question there as well. Yeah. A lot of unproven there at Baylor, obviously. I do think that the schedule is a little manageable. I'll give them a little bit of help. Colorado, BYU, Iowa State kind of in the middle there could be an opportunity to build some Colorado momentum. Colorado State on the road, though. Like- I, I do know <laughs> it's on the road. Maybe it's a little bit early. Yeah, I don't know. Texas Tech could be a little easy after a bye week. I don't know. where. I'm not trying to, you know, speculate too wildly here. There's not going to be loads of auto wins on this schedule because I think the Big 12 is really balanced. Uh, but fortunately, you know, for Baylor at least, this is, you know, I think I think they're going to be in a better position. And I think when you have a quarterback like Daquan Finn, you're going to be in a spot where you can, you know, get yourself into a game that maybe you don't necessarily deserve to be in, right? He's a guy like that can at, steal a game or two. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. At Texas Tech, Texas Tech's better than you. But with Daquan Finn, you know, he comes out, scores a couple points real quick, maybe put up a good defensive effort in that one. You could steal that one. And and I do think that, you know, end of the season, you know, you might have some opportunities as well. TCU could be a win down the stretch. Uh, You know, you got Houston, maybe Kansas at home. I don't know. We'll have to kind of see what they can do. Uh, I'm kind of curious who you're thinking on this list, though, Trey. Who would you want to go with next uh, after Dave Aranda? Hmm. Let's let's go to the let's go to Arkansas. Let's go to Sam Pittman because he's kind yeah. of the low hanging fruit here. Uh, again, we're not talking about Billy Napier, or Ryan Day on this episode. So the low hanging fruit elsewhere is Sam Pittman. He's in year five, and he was the hotness in September 2021. Garrett, I don't know if you remember. Just everyone was singing his praises. They beat A and M for the first time in yep. uh, a decade. It seemed like yep. at that Four point. Oh, yep. Yeah, it, 4-0, ranked in the top 10, going into a big showdown with Georgia. They got shellacked in that game. But he does finish that year 9-4, and 4-4. and That's year two. The future's looking bright. Since then, it has not been pretty. And that bottomed out with a 4-8 and finish, including 1-7 and in SEC play last year. His total record at Arkansas is not awful. 23-25, and 479 winning percentage. But the best he's done is finish tied for third in the sec west and quite frankly that's a fan base that wants to win more than that and you add on top of it that last year was kind of supposed to be the year for them people were talking about arkansas being a dark horse sec west candidate uh kj jefferson was a dark horse heisman candidate they had the backfield going and then they go four and eight and one and seven i know there were a lot of injuries last year but all those guys that you had to be optimistic about are gone from the portal. They arguably yeah. lost more in the portal than maybe anyone else in the SEC last year from a production standpoint. So if I'm an Arkansas fan, I'm left thinking that Pittman might be a dead man walking this year, and I don't know that the schedule really does them any favors either. Yeah, it's – man, 
you gotta ask first, you know, how good was Traylon Burks? That's the first question I have to ask because he kind of made that season for Arkansas. And look, they did win a big game against Penn State to finish the year, but they don't have that big New Year's Six win like Dave Aranda does. They have the actually identical stats in terms of what they've done, yeah. uh, you know, since they've gotten there. It's four years. They're both and one's you know, in the 20, SEC, 20, one's 20. in the Big Twelve. So like, obviously, yep. yeah, obviously, then it gets harder to play in the SEC. Duh, obviously, but he doesn't have the New Year's Six win. He doesn't have that like Dave Aranda does. And also what he does have is, unfortunately for him, a much more passionate fan base at Arkansas than what Baylor has. About. Baylor fans care about their football, but Arkansas fans <laughs> care about their football. And they're not going to sit around too long and, you know, let their head coach suck and let them, you know, just kind of fall down the drain. And when you take, obviously, Traylon Burks was massive to that program, but the thing that made their offense go the last couple of years is K.J. Jefferson and Rocket Sanders. Both of those guys have left the program. Um, and, and so when you're looking around at Arkansas right now, you're saying, hey, I really hope that we've pulled the right <laughs> levers and pressed the right buttons to make this thing work because otherwise your offense is going to be pretty abysmal and you know it could be another really, really tough schedule and season for Arkansas. And I think the hot seat is, you know, fire in the hole, five alarm, like the whole thing is going on in Arkansas right now because Sam Pittman, he's dangerously close to losing his job. I know we've talked about it a couple of times in this pod. He is in the doesn't finish the season territory. For me, he's in the doesn't escape October territory where, you know, things go wrong just right enough. You know, it would be abrupt to lose his job in September, obviously, but I think at some point in October, you lose enough games, you know, drop that game to AM again. Gosh, I mean, you've beaten them one time in 12, 13 years. Go drop that game to AM, drop another couple games on that schedule, start 0 and 3, 0 and 4 in conference. It could be rough for Arkansas. And, and look, it's a new era in the SEC. No more Nick Saban, no more, you know, divisions. Arkansas fans are going to be looking to change it up and say, hey, now that we don't have to play Bama every single year, now that, you know, maybe it's not always LSU, now that it's not always, you know, those big teams, maybe we'll start to get, you know, a little bit of a favorable schedule, build some momentum. And they're not going to want to sit around with Sam Pittman if you can't figure it out. Now, if Sam Pittman has pulled the right levers and, and pressed the right buttons in the portal, then yeah, it could work out for him. You can put me in the doubt camp for that, but if, if he has done that, he could save his job. I, I'm just doubting that he will. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of Arkansas fans probably know that he's a dead man walking and, and just kind of waiting to see how long into the season he makes it before he loses his job. Yeah, I, it's a five out of five fire in the hole for me, too. Jared, <laughs> Pluckers, if you eat 25 fire in the hole wings, you get your name on the wall and like a T-shirt or something <laughs> like that. That's what it's going to take. It's like that Herculean effort that yeah. Sam Pittman is going to have to have to keep his job this year. Look, Taylor Green, very interesting transfer portal pickup. I think he's an interesting dual threat quarterback. He can do a lot of the same things that a healthy KJ Jefferson can do. But you're looking at, you know, you mentioned uh, Traylon Burks I, uh, revitalizing that offense in 2021 and kind of being the cornerstone piece. They want Isaiah Sat Satanega to be that guy, that speedster. I just don't know if he's ready to be a true bona fide SEC one. They don't really have a lot of other guys in that wide receiver room that inspire me to think that, you know, even if Green is a revelation, that he's going to have enough around him to make yeah. that. They do bring back a lot of experience on defense. They only lost a couple starters, I believe, if I'm remembering right. But it's just an uphill battle, man. If I could bet money – on the first coach being fired in college football this year, I think I would bet on Sam Pittman because wow. all this is a start for the schedule this year. Before their bye week on October 12th, Pine Bluff at home, that should be a win, or at War Memorial in Little Rock. Then they go to Oklahoma State, one of the favorites in the Big 12 that always plays better in Stillwater. They have the fight in Trent Dilfords at UAB next at home. Then they have an SEC three-pack of at Auburn, Texas A&M in Arlington, and Tennessee at home. Mm -hmm. You're staring two and four in the face for my money. If you're Arkansas yeah. before the bye week, if they're sitting there at two and four, I don't know how you don't pull the trigger before that bye week and just hope to get something 
get that, some sort of positive momentum to save the team from the transfer portal at that point. Yeah, that's going to be a desperate Arkansas team, I think, going into that A&M game, which, I, look, they're going to throw everything they can at it. Uh, new look A&M team, obviously, with Elko at the helm. But, man, that's going to be probably their best chance to win one of those games, I think, between at Auburn, A&M, and then Tennessee. Auburn, obviously, I don't think is going to be at like as good, but it's your first SEC game. And it is at Jordan Air, so like that's that's never an easy place to play. Um, and you know, I, I'm not trying to trash on Green or anything like that, but it'll be a very different environment from what he's probably used to playing in. Um, and so, look, I'm I'm not trying to be doom and gloom about Arkansas football right now, but I think you have to be realistic if you're an Arkansas fan and say, yeah, Pittman just hasn't gotten it done. We hired an offensive line coach to be a first time head coach. And there's a lot of optimism around some of the personnel and some of what y'all have done. And I get it. Like it, it's, there's reasons for optimism. You have a good season. You have a guy like Traylon Burks. He turns the offense around. That's great. But I think if we're being realistic, you have to say like, yeah, there was just a super stud that we had on our team. And he kind of let us get away with some stuff that we probably shouldn't have gotten away with. Now where they have to look at is saying like, okay, it's time to rebuild. It's time to go make a good coaching hire. There's going to be good coaches out there. There's good assistants out there. Like you can go make a good coaching hire and get back on the ball. It, it just may not be a very nice start to the season for y'all, especially if you are looking, yeah, two and four in the face. And, and you know, that could be pretty rough. Garrett, where to next? Oh, boy. There's a couple on here. I'm actually curious to kind of see, because I know you put this one together. I'm curious to see your thoughts on Shane Beamer at South Carolina, kind of see why we think he's on the – on the hot seat over there. It seems like, you know, just a little bit ago, he was real popular with the team and real popular with the fans. And, you know, he still does technically have a winning record at the school. So I'm kind of curious what our thoughts are. Is Shane Beamer on the hot seat? How hot is his seat over there at South Carolina? Well, I, I put him in here because I wanted to have a discussion about okay. Shane Beamer. And, you know, I don't think he inherited a great situation. He, did not. he took over in Columbia, but I, you know, it was, it was kind of an interesting hire, a guy that had a lot of connections to the area. They were hoping that he would, you know, build up through recruiting and have some quick success there. In his first two years, he really overachieved, made a couple bowl games, won that Duke's Mayo game. He was the first coach ever to get that Mayo bath, if I do recall. So, you know, seven and six, eight and five, 2021, 2022. Not bad at all, finishing third in the East in 2022. But last year, clear step back, five and seven, three and five in an SEC East that I don't think was necessarily a murderer's row in 2023. So, you know, this is a pivotal year for him. I, I'm going to put his hot seat status. It, it's not a four out of five. It's not a three out of or five out of five. I'm going to put it somewhere between a hallelujah and a vampire killer. Maybe like a two and a half yeah, two and a three. emojis if you're looking at your wing restaurant menu, right? So I think he's lost a lot of talent. He's also dipped into the portal. You mentioned Ishmael Sanders from Arkansas. His new destination is South Carolina. But last year just kind of left a lot to be desired. I think left a sour taste. He, he debuted so hot that it was just so disappointing for him to miss a bowl game. And it was really defined by a four-week stretch in the middle of the season last year. They went 0-4 against Tennessee, Florida, Mizzou, and Texas A&M. Those are four teams that had more talent than South Carolina, 100%. I will give you that. That is a rough four-week-in-a-row stretch. but And they almost rallied back. They were sitting there at, what, 2-6 uh, and six after that game at Texas A&M? And they rallied back one three in a row and almost beat Clemson to make a bowl game. So, you know, the finish was stronger, but that midseason swoon, man, just really left a lot to be desired. They weren't even really close in any of those games other than the Florida one at home. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, I, I just think this is going to be a pivotal season for Shane Beamer. I, I wouldn't put him on the hot seat yet. I wanted to have a conversation about him because last year was so disappointing in a down SEC East, but just want to have a conversation. I'd put him at about a two and a half flame emojis, probably lean more towards the hallelujah at two. Flame right. Emojis. 
I think I'm tempted to agree with you. Is there a hot sauce where it just like it's not hot at all, and then you kind of wait for a little bit, and then it gets real hot? Because I think that's where Shane Beamer is. I think this could be a really, really tough season for Shane Beamer and in, in, in South Carolina. If you look at the schedule, this is kind of – I hadn't even looked at their schedule yet. This is where I'm kind of going to say, oh, this could get hot because it's not really a place to build momentum on this schedule. If you're looking at them this year, they go Old Dominion at Kentucky. Wait, at Kentucky right out of the gate? Yeah, at Kentucky right out of the gate. LSU is week three, and then Akron – is week four. Now, Akron, I don't think I'd pick them to win that game immediately, but you better watch out because that's a proud Akron team, and they're going to walk in there with the upset. Oh, okay. Okay. They're, they're going to be walking out <laughs> the money, and you might be looking at a one and two South Carolina team that just got beat down a couple weeks in a row. That I'd be more worried about Old Dominion sneaking up on them week one than I than mean, Akron, Akron. I mean, I don't know. Anyways, uh, Regardless, let's say that you're three and one. I would say optimistically after that, you get your bye week, and then tell me where along this last half of the season you stack wins: Ole Miss at Alabama, at Oklahoma, and then another bye, Texas A&M at home, at Vanderbilt, Mizzou, Wofford at Clemson. I, I don't think see a win. Wofford, Wofford should be a win. win. Vanderbilt will be a win. And I don't see where you stack lots of wins. Like, I, let's say that they beat a uh, and or Missouri. Probably not both, but let's say that they beat one or the other. Even if you beat both of those teams, that's, what, four straight max on that schedule with a and Vanderbilt, Missouri, and then Wofford. That's maybe four straight that you could maybe optimistically say, yeah, we feel great about that. But Ole Miss, Bama, and Oklahoma in the middle of October – Hey, dude, that's not fun. That's not a good way to to start your season. And that's if they're three and one with a lot of momentum. And let's say they just lost to LSU. If they go two and two in those games and then lose three in a row, you could be talking about what two and five going into the last part of the season. That's not a real confident team going into those games against AM, Vanderbilt, Mizzou, where you kind of need to get up for at least AM and Mizzou, you need to get up for those games and make sure you bring your A game. They could be yeah. tough. And if you're looking at a four or five win South Carolina team, yeah, it's going to be a hot seat next year. I, I think we might be just a year early on the hot seat on this one. So I will say it's probably about a two, but like he's got to prove something this year. And and I think he's going with what Sellers is the quarterback and Sanders is his running back. Like you got to hope that that's going to be the, you know, the, the, equation that gets you over the top because Spencer Rattler didn't quite do it for you. He had an okay year, probably not quite what a lot of uh, Gamecock fans thought he was going to do, but I mean, I, I don't know where you're saying there's a massive improvement on this offense outside of saying, yeah, Rocket Sanders is a really good player and he's going to change your running back room because he will, he'll, he'll be really good for you. But I mean, one good running back does not an amazing offense make, uh, and so I guess you got to kind of wait and see what South Carolina is going to throw out there. It could be a tough season for them. Yeah, I it sounds like you're at about a maple chipotle, Garrett. Like maybe about a, a maple sweet chipotle. start, but a spicy finish. For I like Shane a Gilbert. maple chipotle. Okay, I like I've it. I've never had it. I haven't had it, but it sounds like the description here is a sweet syrupy glaze with a smoky chipotle kick. And that sounds exactly like what Shane Beamer might experience this year because you're right. There's no runway on that schedule. It, it, yeah. it, it's tough. And I think that's why I wanted to bring this up. I think the honeymoon might be over after this year and he could be looking at a situation like Sam Pittman. Right. Now he could roll off a few of these. Like if he beats Kentucky, beats a and beats Mizzou, get, plays it close with Clemson or upsets them again. Not now we're talking, right? Yeah, but what if he makes one of those cool rap videos again? You know, that might up that the could, heat. Even that more. could do I'm something. Not lie to you. <laughs> that, that might up the heat. Even as long more. as he's not standing behind the players, kind of creepy while it's spinning around like Brian Kelly, I think he's all right. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, those PSA to college coaches just just stay out of the recruits' videos. Like you, you don't need regular. to do that. Hire some, hire an analyst, or hire like some college age guys or preferably girls 
to get in the videos right. with them. That's what the recruits want. They don't want you yeah. in the background creeping. They don't want some old white dude just sitting there like, hey, uh, what's going on? I'm also a part of it. It's like, no, yeah. you're there to call plays and recruit and tell them how much NIL money they get. You're not you, there. You close the deal. Cool you close thing. the deal. Let your, let your yeah. recruiting staff handle the videos yeah. and the photo shoot. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. 100%. All right, Garrett, where are we going next? Whew, we might – this might be the last one, so I got to make sure we're making this one right. Well, I think we got um, time for two more, maybe. Uh, we'll squeeze in a couple maybe. more. We're we'll squeeze in a couple. Well, if we got time for two, then I do want to talk about Mike Loxley up in Maryland because, you know, I've, I was obviously the big just Maryland me. homer. Yeah, <laughs> the big Maryland homer. I still got my turf shirt hanging up over there in the background. I still love the Maryland Terrapins, but it looks like things could be uh, cooling off pretty quick there. For my turps. So, yeah, I'm curious to kind of think your reasoning on Mike Loxley on the hot seat. Well, listen, I, again, another guy I wanted to just start a conversation with. And I think he, Mike Loxley, might benefit more from mega conferences than any other coach in America. Because how many times has he had a decent team on the field? And I think if he was still, if Maryland was still in the ACC, or if they were in a lesser conference, that we'd be saying, hey, they're, they're a plucky little team in, in, in Maryland. They, they got a nice little team over there, and they might cause some trouble for somebody in a playoff because they made a run to their conference championship in a Big 12 or an ACC, right? But they were in the Big 10 East and had to play Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State every year. They had to deal yeah. with Michigan State's good run for a couple of years. They had to deal with, you know, a, an uprising Rutgers and just a tough situation. The best finish he's ever had was the last two years. He's won three bowl games in a row, eight and five, eight and five, seven and six. And he's finished fourth in the East behind the big three for two years, uh, two years running. So I'm not going to say that Mike Loxley has been unsuccessful at Maryland. I'm just asking the question in a world where super conferences now exist, if he goes eight and five again without having to play Michigan, Ohio State, and uh, Penn State, does he start, does the patience start to wear thin a little bit? Or is he built up enough goodwill that he can have a couple of clunker seasons even and survive that? Yeah, man, it really just kind of depends on how the schedule breaks down. Like, I, I think the good news for him is, and I don't want to be, presumptuous here but i think a lot of maryland fans are a little bit more understanding than the average college football fan because they do kind of have to just sit behind a lot of those teams that have built up big power programs and try to claw their way upwards and they know what they're up against and i think a lot of them realize that loxley is a good coach but that yeah it's sometimes just circumstances stack up against you this year is where it gets a little hot for loxley okay so this is where loxley he's got to finally deliver if he doesn't deliver i mean on this schedule i don't know what else you're supposed to do. look at the schedule real quick start with yukon yukon may be sneaky but they should win that game michigan state you should win that game virginia you should win that game villanova you should win that game indiana you should win that game you get a bye week and then it's northwestern you should win that game so you should be bowl eligible before you play USC at home. Okay, now, am I predicting 6-0 Maryland going into the USC game? No, because I tried to believe last year, and I'm going to kind of sit back and hold my cards a little closer to the vest this year. I'm not out on Maryland. I'm just saying I think that they probably need to think about, uh, you know, what they need to do to fix the program so they don't keep randomly throwing up an L that doesn't belong on the schedule. It, it kind of seems like that's the thing with Maryland is, that's they'll, been that's been the killer for, for the right. Church. They'll compete back. randomly and just like there'll be a minute left against Ohio State and they're down two. And you're like, oh, what's happening? How is Maryland in this game? They might actually win. And then it rattles off and it all falls apart and it's fine. But then they'll just like drop some random game to like, you know, Indiana or something like that. And it just kind of seems like you can't really. You know, go one way or the other. And I'm not saying these are obviously like results. I'm just saying this is what it, it seems obvious to see on a, you know, any given year Maryland schedule is well, they're winning yeah, games you should and you're losing year, games you shouldn't. 
case in point last year, they're, they're sitting at five and oh, right. They lose mm-hmm. to Ohio state at Columbus. That's fine. Then you yep. follow that up by losing to Illinois on homecoming and yep. at Northwestern. That, that just, just can't, can't do that happen. If you want to take the next step as a program. Yeah. And you know, to their credit, like if you are six wins at that point, you're looking at the back part of the schedule. It's pretty tough. You got USC at home. You go to Minnesota. You could probably still win that game. Then you get another bye week before you go to Oregon. That's a long flight across the country. Rutgers at home, Iowa at home, and then at Penn State to finish your year. You could go over in those, you know, last four games. Like, I mean, over in November wouldn't shock me necessarily. I think you probably beat Rutgers, but you could go over in that stretch, and that's you know a pretty rough ending to the year. So I think you just have to look at it and say, like, hey, there's gonna need to be some understanding of what we're working with. Obviously, losing to Leah. You're not going to have your quarterback you've had recently, so you're going to have to break somebody new in. So there's going to be an adjustment and a learning curve regardless. Um, and, you know, you're looking at a pretty tough back half of the schedule where you're saying, hey, even if we do start 6-0, and if we finish 7-5 and or 8-4, and that still might be a pretty good season given the circumstances, right? So I, I think there has to be some understanding on the schedule. There has to be some understanding in the fan base. Go ahead and put me down for like a, a two, maybe a three on the hot seat. But this season, again, could be a make or break for Mike Loxley. Yeah, I, I love that you said that because I, I think the schedule is really manageable and they got quietly maybe one of the best sleeper portal pickups in MJ Morris at quarterback. He was a backup at NC State, played a lot for the wolf pack over the years as different injuries surface but i think that he could be a real steal in the portal for maryland we could look back at that and say that's a program changing pickup in the portal for mike loxley so i'm gonna put him on a honey barbecue right now garrett you've talked me into it i I was a little concerned (laughs) about the results because again whether it's purdue a couple years ago or um yeah they've just had so many what the heck losses that you just shouldn't have. And they could be so much better than they have been, but you got to talk about where they're at in program development. I think Mike Loxley's done a really good job resurrecting that program and stability, stabilizing it yeah. after the whole DJ Durkin debacle. So yeah, yeah I'm going to put him at a honey barbecue, uh, lowest yeah. spice ranking on that hot seat. Things would have to really crash and burn for it to be a problem this year. They also bring back quite a bit of talent on defense from a top 30. Yeah, that defense should be pretty good. And they played well in stretches last season. Obviously, like, you're not going to get top-end production against Ohio State. So, like, don't worry about teams like that. But they played pretty well on defense in spots last year. I think you can build on that and build some real momentum this year. You're going to have to win a bunch of games to start the season. I think they can. If not, you know, that seat could be heating up, though. Well, Garrett, uh, that great discussion. I mistimed it, and I think I'm ready to go watch some baseball and be a glass case of emotion. So let's wrap it right there. There's obviously some other guys we could talk about. Pat Narduzzi at Pitt, Kalani Sataki at BYU. Some really interesting names, Small other names that might be on retirement watch following the lead of Nick Saban this year. It's going to be mm-hmm. fascinating to watch some of these storylines develop. But for now, keep it locked right here. Let us know in the comments. Let us know on social media at three tech pod on Instagram and Twitter. Who do you have on the hot seat? What is your hot seat ranking for these coaches? Give us a sauce level that you would like uh, for these hot seat levels and do write in at three tech pod at gmail.com. Let us know. Don't forget to fill out those surveys to enter to win the $150 gift card to home field apparel and stay locked right here because preview season is getting started in just a couple of weeks. We are really excited to get that kicked off. For Garrett Turney, for Mitch Mason, I am Trey Reeves. Giga Mags, we'll see you next time. Gracious, yeah.